And um, I have referred to this one in one of the previous lectures, um, but I'm going to show a little bit more detail now. So this is um, an example using the nanopore. And this was a study that was done during the recent outbreak of Ebola virus in Africa, uh, where, it, as, as you probably remember, Ebola is um, very unpleasant, very infectious, um, spread very rapidly from person to person. And there was a real um, crisis uh, in treating it. And a lot of people um, went out from various different countries, in, including the UK, to try to help contain the spread of the virus. And you probably remember those pictures from the news of people wearing all over body suits and you know, being hosed down and one or two people still got sick and so on. And so a big issue with Ebola was um, where is it coming from, how is it spreading, what were the routes of transmission? And uh, this is something I mentioned to you before, um, which was a study that was partly coordinated again from Birmingham. Um, this is a very nice example where you want information really quickly and you want it from locations where medical facilities are pretty limited and people aren't going to be able to afford large expensive equipment. And obviously, uh, nanopore sequencing is ideal for this. So this was a study basically where um, a bunch of people, including um, Josh Quick, who's a PhD student here, who's, you see, first author on this Nature paper, um, went out to Guinea, uh, carrying with them some, uh, some nanopore uh, devices and some cheap laptops, and trained up some of the local people in sequencing, and then gathered genome sequence information from um, both stored examples of the virus and from survivors of the virus and um, also samples from people who died. And in all, they managed to capture around about 5% of the total data. So there was something like you know, several thousand people died. They got over a 1,000 genomes from this and then did the same sort of process that I've just shown you with the cholera epidemic, built a map of how this thing had spread. Now, in the case of the cholera epidemic, you're looking at something that had spread over 30 or 40 years. In the case of the Ebola epidemic, you're looking at something that spread over a matter of, of, of weeks or months, so it was much quicker. Um, and one of the beauties of this study was that the information was coming out literally in real time, and they were able to feed that information back to people who were trying to limit movement in different places and explain to them um, how that, you know, where, where that would be most effectively done. So I've got another nice little link for you here. Now, what I'm going to show you is... Um, it's a video which has been created which tracks the spread of Ebola virus from place to place. Um, and it does that using all sorts of different data, including um, straightforward medical data, how many people have been infected, how many people have died. Uh, what you've got here is, is a map of um, uh, this is Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, color-coded. You'll see the different regions, which are different um, administrative regions within each country, going darker in color. So the darkness of color represents how many outbreaks there are. But you'll also see lots of little arrows flying all over the place. And what that represents is movement of the virus, so routes of transmission. Uh, you'll see there'll be certain centres where the virus becomes quite abundant. And um, those centres will have a little red circle that gets bigger and bigger. And that represents how many different genotypes of the virus were present at that particular place um, when it was being monitored. So this actually gives you um, a dramatic map of an epidemic. So every one of those arrows is a viral transmission event where a virus has moved from place to place. And at this stage, the epidemic is still fairly small, but you can see it really starts to take off around about now. And you can see how it's spreading between countries. You can see how it's spreading between different parts of the countries. And some of the um, transmission routes are quite, pretty lengthy. And then about now, the, the epidemic starts to fall off, but it hasn't finished. There's still... Um, a few events taking place, like that one. So this kind of information is really valuable to people who are trying to deal with outbreaks like this. And the fact that it was generated while the epidemic was still happening actually helped to control the epidemic, actually helped to um, limit movement in certain areas. And this, all this information, uh, in terms of the arrows, has come from looking at the linkage between all the different strains of, of virus. I don't think we do it like that, can't we? What's that doing up there? Don't really want to see the office. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know what that's doing on there. Um, the, um, 
ability to track this in real time and to advise people about uh, where to limit movement, where the, the biggest numbers of viruses are coming from is incredibly useful for people who are trying to deal with an outbreak in real time. Same sort of thing, but on a more local scale. So we're going now from the scale of a whole country, uh, or several countries in this case, down to a single hospital. And this was a paper that was published uh, in 2012, and it was looking at an outbreak of MRSA, which is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's essentially a strain of Staph aureus, which is um, resistant to most antibiotics. Uh, and this took place in a neonatal unit, a, a baby unit in a hospital. And again, genome sequencing information was very valuable here. So uh, Staph aureus, we're all populated by it. We carry it on our skin, we carry it in our nose. It doesn't cause any problems by and large, um, but it's not a good thing to get an infection with. It can cause septicemia, which is a, a blood infection. Um, and it's a particular problem if it's multiply antibiotic resistant, as um, MRSA is. And then it becomes very hard to treat. And the septicemia can um, be fatal. It's a, something that people in hospitals are very worried about because it can spread within the confines of a hospital quite easily. And anyone that's been to hospital recently, um, you, you'll see every ward you go on to, there'll be a little hand wash station at, at the end of each ward. Do use it because people in hospitals are working very hard to try to stop infections spreading from ward to ward. And just walking from one ward to the next, if you touch something in that ward that somebody else has touched, can very easily move a bacterial strain into a ward where there might be people who are immunocompromised, for example, or um, young babies, as in this case. So there was a special baby care unit. This is a hospital in Cambridge um, where uh, premature babies were having um, intensive care. Um, the outbreak spread pretty quickly, and several of the babies in the unit got infected. Uh, luckily, none of them died, but they were pretty sick. And there were all sorts of questions to ask, which were, where did this come from? Was it one of the babies had brought it in? Um, had it come from medical staff? Um, was it from somebody else who'd been admitted to one of the other wards and it had been transmitted from the other ward to the baby unit? Or was it being transmitted from the baby unit to the other wards? These are all things um, that were being looked at. Now, this is the key data. So each line on this figure represents a patient. Okay, so you've got a series of horizontal lines. Each one of those is a different patient. And um, each uh, little division is a day. And what you've got here is... Uh, uh, sorry, each number... Yeah, these are, these are the patients. These are patients who are on the um, intensive care unit, the neonatal intensive care unit, the NICU. These are patients elsewhere in the hospital who are also being monitored. And the colour coding, um, if... It's a, um, this is just doing a swab, so they just take a, um, something like a little tip, swab the skin of the baby, spread it out on an agar plate, just as you were doing a couple of days ago, and look and see whether there's staph growing and see if it's methicillin resistant or not. In the cases where it's red, um, the answer is yes, it is resistant. If it's blue, it's not resistant or it's not growing. So what you can see um, is that around about this time, all these babies, apart from baby number three, who's got lucky, uh, became infected. So swabs taken from these babies were repeatedly coming up positive for this particular bacterium. And there were some patients elsewhere in the hospital um, down here who were also coming up positive. And places where you've got either um, a little black box there or a red box with a star on, uh, a genome sequence was done. So there weren't a lot of genome sequences in this case. Um, but what was done here was to uh, sequence the genomes in the baby unit and also samples from the patients elsewhere in the hospital. Uh, at this point, they shut down the unit because so many babies were getting infected. They realised that babies coming in were becoming infected and that was you know, more serious and so those babies were sent elsewhere. All those genome sequences were then analysed um, and a few important things were found out. First of all, the patients in different parts of the hospital getting MRSA, mostly we're getting a different form of it. It wasn't a related, it was the same organism, but it was a different strain. And that could be told from the genome sequence. That meant that although they had to cl close down the baby ward, it wasn't necessary to shut down the other wards as well. And that's an important thing if you're a hospital manager, because obviously closing down wards is a, a major undertaking. And um, it also turned out that the DNA sequence data was very good at predicting whether or not these strains were antibiotic resistant and what they were resistant to. It was a lot quicker than doing a standard 
resistance profiling experiment. So that's very important for the doctors who want to treat. Um, but also it was shown that the um, transmission was occurring between babies within the neonatal unit. So it was the same strain that had infected the neonatal unit. And it was actually eventually tracked down to one of the nurses on the unit who was um, asymptomatic, an asymptomatic carrier. So she was infected with MRSA, didn't have any symptoms, was perfectly healthy, but she was treating and handling these babies and she was passing the infection on to them and they were then getting sick as a consequence. So it wasn't remotely her fault, she wasn't sort of doing anything that she shouldn't have been doing, but she then had to be then taken out of that unit um, and essentially decontaminated in order to deal with that particular problem. Okay, so that's um, just a very small <coughs> example of the sorts of things that all this genome sequence data can be used for. There are many others, you'll hear more about them uh, in, the, in the course of um, the rest of the degree. So now we're going to change gears a bit. We're going to move from uh, DNA sequencing to RNA sequencing and think about using DNA sequence methods to study not genes and genomes, but the expression of genes within those genomes. Now, as you will probably know, there's lots of ways that you can look at the expression of individual genes. And these have been around for, you know, in some cases, 30, 40 years. Uh, the classic one, that's called the original one that people used, was, was northern blotting, where you'd run RNA down a gel. You'd have a probe which corresponded to the sequence of the gene you're interested in. You'd hybridize that probe. Um, you'd, sorry, you'd, you'd blot the RNA onto a filter. You'd hybridize the radioactive probe to that filter. And if it lit up, it meant that your gene was being expressed. And, and that works pretty well. Um, and those of us of a certain age are, are very familiar with those sorts of things. It's called northern blotting, by the way, because the guy that invented um, southern blotting, which is the same thing with DNA, was called Professor Southern. That was his name. So there was never a Professor Northern, um, but you know, once we had southern blotting, we had to have northern blotting and western blotting as well. People have been trying for years to invent something to call it eastern blotting, but it never really took off. Other methods, RNA's protection. So RNA's protection, again, requires you to know the sequence of your RNA um, what you do in RNA's protection is to isolate total message, hybridize it with a probe, again, which corresponds to your, um, your message, digest away everything that's single-stranded, and what's left corresponds to the thing you want to look at. So it's quite easy to do, a um, little bit tedious, but it, it works pretty well. Quantitative um, real-time reverse transcriptase PCR is a bit of a mouthful, but it's a very commonly used method for looking at gene expression, um, which essentially uses PCR... You start off by taking messenger RNA, you turn it into DNA using reverse transcriptase, which is the enzyme that turns RNA to DNA, and then you can use primers for your gene of interest um, in a PCR reaction to measure how much DNA there is corresponding to your gene. And then there's promoter probes, which we use a lot. They're very easy to use, uh, where you take the promoter for the gene you're interested in and you fuse it to some sort of reporter gene, like typically... Um, green fluorescent protein or uh, LAC-Z or luciferase, um, and then you can use the activity of the reporter gene as a proxy for the activity of the gene you're interested in. Now, that's a very powerful and useful method. Now, all these methods are great, and they've all been used for many years, and they all tell us useful stuff about gene expression, but they all suffer from the limitation that they're very specific to individual genes. So if you want to look at one gene at a time, they're very good. If you want to look at lots of genes simultaneously, they're not good at all. So we want to use, move on to methods where we look at many genes simultaneously. Ideally, we want to look at all the genes simultaneously in a given experiment, every single gene in the organism. And we've discussed microarray experiments already in, in BioM10, so just to remind you briefly how these work, um, with a microarray experiment... Um, you're looking at what we call the transcriptome. So the transcriptome is the summary of all the message, uh, all the RNA, particularly the messenger RNA, that's being expressed in the cell at any one time. Note, incidentally, as it says in this slide here, that the transcriptome is very different from the genome. The genome is pretty much the same in all cells all the time. There's some exceptions with the immune cells and so on, but basically your genome is the same in all your cells. The transcriptome varies a lot. It varies from cell to cell, it varies over time, it depends on the conditions, 
Um, it, it, it can respond to things like hormones and, and heat and so on. So the transcriptome is very dynamic, whereas the genome is pretty much, um, apart from splicing and, and immune cells and, and mutation, is pretty much static. So looking at um, the transcriptome, looking at all genes at the same time, requires you to have knowledge of um, a genome sequence if you're going to do a microarray. His, I've been through this already, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. We want to compare gene expression in these two cell types, uh, the green cells and the red cells. So we isolate total RNA from both of those two cell types. We convert this to cDNA, and we label this cDNA with a green fluorescent dye, this cDNA with a red fluorescent dye, and um, we hybridize that to a microarray. And the microarray is a, simply uh, a glass slide which has got printed on it oligonucleotides which are complementary to every single gene in the organism. So if a gene is expressed in both cell types, it'll hybridize with cDNA from both of these pools. It'll be seen as yellow on the array like there and there. If it's only expressed in the red cells, it will uh, appear as red and, and so on. Okay, so um, that's the basic idea of a microarray. So microarrays are very powerful. Um, they, they were used a lot. They're still used quite a lot. But they do have, um, again, some problems. One is that for every organism that you look at, you've got to have a new microarray. So you need to know the complete genome sequence. You've got to design the primers, make those primers. And we may be talking 15, 16,000 primers here and um, immobilize those on the glass slide. So that's a lot of work. You can only detect the genes for which you've got probes. So if there are genes which, are, which you've missed in your genome annotation and you haven't made probes for those, you won't see them. Um, but a particular problem is, is technical. It turns out, although the array technology is very good, the dynamic range is quite poor. So between a well-expressed gene and a very well-expressed gene, the signal doesn't change very much. So it's actually quite hard to accurately measure the range of levels of expression using a microarray. And also, again, for technical reasons, um, there are big issues with backgrounds. So quite often, uh, it's quite hard to extract the signal, which is what you want to see, from the background, which is just the probe hybridizing randomly, which you don't want to see. And there are ways and means of doing that, um, but it, it's technically quite complex. Now, given that we can now <coughs> sequence DNA quite easily using things like Illumina, um, an alternative to this is very obvious, which is, as before, you convert your RNA into cDNA, um, but then instead of labelling it and hybridising it to a microarray, you just treat it as though it was DNA for a normal genome sequencing reaction. Um, you convert it into small fragments, you make a library, you sequence it, and that then tells you what RNA you had present. And that gives us the transcriptome, the description of all the RNA, in this case the messenger RNA, that's present inside the cell. Um, incidentally, this kind of omics um, nomenclature is something that you'll get very familiar with. So we, we know, you all know about the genome, which is all the DNA. Transcriptome is all the RNA. The proteome um, is all the proteins. The metabolome is all the metabolites. And in an ideal experiment, you finish up with a catalogue of all of these, not only what they are, but also what their levels are. For DNA, that's fairly straightforward, as we've been discussing. For RNA, it's reasonably straightforward. For protein and particularly for metabolites, it's quite hard. And um, you'll hear more, a lot more about the transcriptome from Professor Luo, and then you'll hear about proteomics from Professor Cooper and metabolomics from Professor Bayan, all of whom are experts in those respective fields and all of whom will, will flag up the analytical methods that we use and some of the drawbacks um, and some of the limitations of those methods. So you're going to become very familiar with this terminology. Um, and all of these, apart from the, the genome, are dynamic and, and change. In the case of the metabolome, really rapidly, sometimes within seconds, which makes them very hard and very challenging to look at. Um, but these changes can be very important. If we're trying to figure out what's going on inside cells, understanding those changes as they take place is a really useful thing to be able to do. So um, we'll take a look a little bit more detail um, how RNA-seq works and take a quick look at a couple of examples and then I think there'll be time to say something about taking that even a step further and looking at um, uh, translation. So um, the first step of RNA-seq is to grow your cells up, obviously, expose them to the condition that you're interested in and extract 
the total RNA from those cells. That in itself is not necessarily trivial. If you're working with bacteria, RNA has a very short half-life, and some RNAs have half-lives of less than a minute, so you've got to work really fast um, and under very denaturing conditions to get the RNA out and to know that what you're seeing is really what was present in the cell. Now, one of the problems that you've got if you're interested in gene expression is actually most of the RNA in your cells is not messenger RNA. By far the majority of RNA in your cells is ribosomal RNA. So um, when you make an RNA prep, if you just were to convert that directly to cDNA and sequence that, you just get lots and lots of ribosomal sequences, which would be pretty boring because you already know what the ribosomal sequences are. So you've got to somehow get rid of or avoid having ribosomal RNA in your sample. And there's different ways of doing this. Um, one method that, that we use quite a bit with bacterial RNA um, are um, magnetic beads, which are coated with um, oligonucleotides that hybridize to ribosomal RNAs. So all the ribosome, um, message, the ribosome signal sticks to the beads, which we can then remove with a, a strong magnet, and what's left is mostly message. If you're lucky enough to work on um, eukaryotes, there's a much simpler method, which is that eukaryotic messenger RNA, as you'll know, has a polyadenylation tail at the three prime end. Uh, this is not true with bacteria, so this method doesn't work with bacteria. So if you use the polyadenylation tail to make your cDNA, you're not going to make cDNA from the ribosomal RNA because that doesn't contain a poly A tail. So your first step is to use uh, an oligonucleotide primer, which is a poly T. This will hybridize to the poly A, the three prime end of the message, and then to synthesize uh, cDNA using reverse transcriptase. So then your cDNA collection will only represent DNA made from the messenger RNA. You then get rid of the RNA and using a, a DNA's free RNAs that digests away all the RNA, so you're left only with cDNA. Um, and then uh, from that point on, it's pretty much the same as standard Illumina sequencing. You take your cDNA, you fragment it, uh, you attach primers to the ends, and that's your library, which is then hybridized to a flow cell, and uh, you can then sequence that using standard Illumina technology. So the sequences that you've now got only represent regions of the genome which are transcribed. So anything that's not being converted into message won't be part of your sequence information. You're just looking at what corresponds to the RNA. And this is called um, RNA seq, RNA sequencing. Uh, now, if you're lucky, you'll have a complete genome sequence available for the organism. And then the analysis step is, as before, you have to do the same sort of quality control. And then you assemble the reads, uh, sorry, you align the reads against your reference genome to see which parts of the genome are being transcribed. Even if you don't have a genome sequence available, you can still take the transcriptome and assemble that. You won't know the relative position of the different genes, but you will know which genes are being expressed. So you can use this as a way of sort of assembling a very partial genome and getting information about how that genome is being expressed, even if you don't have a genome sequence available. Whereas for microarrays, you've got to have the genome sequence in order to be able to design the oligonucleotides that go onto the slide. Um, so here's a, a diagram of that process. You've got um, your polyadenylated message, cDNA, which is then fragmented. Um, you attach your linkers to either end, get your short sequence reads with the Illumina, same as we looked at before, and then align these against um, the genome sequence. We'll look at this diagram in a bit more detail in just a sec. Now, one of the reasons that RNA sequencing is so useful is it doesn't only tell you which genes are being expressed, it tells you how much they're being expressed. And the reason for this is that the number of sequences that you get for a particular gene correspond more or less to how much message for that gene was in the cell. So if a gene is being very strongly expressed, it's making lots of mRNA, that means you'll get lots of cDNA corresponding to that gene, and you'll get lots of sequences corresponding to that gene in your RNA-seq library. So with genome sequences, this isn't true. With genome sequences, pretty much all regions are equally represented. Um, for RNA sequences, you'll get big differences between different genes because the levels of expression are very different between different genes. So that means that you not only find out what genes are expressed, you also find out the levels at which they're expressed. And that's um, obviously very useful. And it turns out this, um, the dynamic range with RNA-seq is very high. So it's much better than microarrays. 
So you can go something like a five-fold order of magnitude in levels of expression. That's, that's quite detectable using an RNA-seq platform, whereas a microarray might do a couple of orders of magnitude at best. So although um, you know, we weren't to know this before people started doing it, it turns out to have much better range than microarrays. What it also has um, over microarrays is much better resolution. You can, for example, determine the start site of every single gene in your organism because your cDNA won't proceed beyond the start point of the message. So all your cDNAs for a given gene um, at the 5' end will end at the same point, which is the point at which the transcript started. Now, you can't get that kind of information from a microarray. So RNA-seq in general is, is seen as preferable to microarrays, and these days more people are doing RNA-seq than are doing arrays. It is, unfortunately, expensive to do, and so each experiment is, is pretty pricey. If you're dealing with a eukaryotic message, there are essentially three sorts of reads that you get. You get what are called exonic reads, and these correspond to the actual coding sequence. So this is reads that represent parts of the gene which are going to go on and be translated. You also um, will get junction reads, and we'll look at these diagrammatically in a minute. They're rather like the paired end reads. They correspond to sequences on either side of a splice site where an intron has been spliced out of the message in the nucleus. And then um, you'll also tend to get some um, reads which are just bits of polydenylation which are not terribly interesting. So here's that diagram again at a slightly um, larger level. So the exonic reads, so these are short illumina reads, remember, two or three hundred bases at best, corresponding to the coding sequence of this gene. Now here's, in this gene, we've got the open reading frame here, but here there's an intron. So this gene contains a single intron which will be transcribed in the nucleus but then very quickly spliced out. So the message that goes to the cytoplasm will lack that region. What this means is you're going to get some reads um, where, remember, these will be joined up in the RNA, where you've got reads on either side of, that, of those splice junctions. And this is very useful because it enables you very quickly to map where the introns are in the gene. So you can tell by um, overlaying the frequency of reads with the position along the gene, here, very obviously, is an intron that's been spliced out, Here's the start site of transcription of the gene. And um, that's useful because splice sites are actually quite hard to predict just by looking at sequence data, whereas RNA-seq will tell you pretty much unambiguously where the introns are and where they're removed. So um, here's an example. This happens to be from um, plant RNA from different, different um, bits of the plant or different treatments. Um, what you've got in the bottom row are predicted transcripts from the genome sequence. And um, the vertical bars represent exons, and you've got different coding regions here, um, like the one shown in, in red there. Uh, then what you've got here, sorry, is some control tissue, uh, some tissue that's been exposed to cold, and some pollen. So you're looking at the expression levels of different genes um, under normal conditions, uh, in pollen, and under cold conditions. Now what you can see straight away is that here's a gene which is very highly expressed in pollen. You're getting lots and lots of reads um, for that gene. A couple of introns in there, um, but that gene is not expressed at high levels in control tissue um, or under cold, very highly expressed in pollen. Um, there's some indication here of a gene that may be no, actually not. it's not really cold shock induced, is it? But this gene looks like it might be cold shock induced. So this just shows three or four genes in a typical RNA-seq experiment. You'd be looking at thousands of genes like this, comparing their expression under different conditions or in different tissues, um, and really getting um, a feel for where they're expressed, when they're expressed, and so on. So it's really powerful. Anything that's transcribed, and in the case of eukaryotic, RNA polyadenylated will be picked up by RNA-seq. And one of the things that we've learned over recent years, and you, you'll hear more about this in other lectures, um, is that the old idea of RNA, ribosomal RNA, messenger RNA, transfer RNA, is actually um, underestimates quite substantially the number of different sorts of RNAs that there are inside the cell. So there are also what are called microRNAs and short inhibiting RNAs. These are RNAs that are not turned into protein, but which are produced by the cell in order to control the expression of other genes. And there's lots of these. 
and um, RNA sequencing will pick these up. Uh, there's also long RNAs, which are very, very long transcripts, and it's still kind of controversial whether those are actually real or not, um, but they can be picked up, um, or you can get a, a weak signal from them uh, in RNA-seq experiments. And a lot of these things, again, would have been missed by microarrays, because people didn't realize that some very short stretches of DNA were being transcribed, so they didn't design primers to them um, in, their, in, in constructing the microarrays. RNA-seq will capture everything, as long as you do the experiment properly, um, and so you get insights into all the different kinds of RNA that are being produced. And that's really kind of opened up a whole new field um, in terms of RNA-mediated gene regulation. You can see in transplice sites as well, um, I've talked about that, as this gives you information about the sequence on either side of the splice site. So that's a real quick gallop through RNA-seq. You'll hear a lot more about that in the next few lectures. So RNA-seq um, still has its limitations. All these techniques have their, their limitations. They tell you good things, but they miss stuff as well. And one of the things about RNA-seq is it tells you what's being transcribed. It tells you what messages are being produced. What it doesn't do is tell you whether or not those messages are actually being translated, whether they're being turned into protein. And you might think, well, why would that matter? Um, surely if something's being expressed as a message, it's being expressed as a protein as well. And it turns out, Surprisingly, that's actually not true. Um, that the correlation between gene expression at the RNA level and protein levels at the protein level is not that good. And this is a bit, bit of a surprise, and we still don't fully understand it, um, but it means that an RNA-seq experiment on its own is not enough to tell us how well different proteins are going to be expressed. So um, a few years back, people started to think, well, can we use this method or some um, variation of this method to look not just at genes which are being transcribed, but messages which are being translated, messages which are being turned into protein in the cell. And um, they call this the translatome. So this is the sum total of all the messages which are being translated. Uh, and this is rather like PCR. This is one of those techniques that when I first heard it described to me, in the first 30 seconds, like, why didn't I think of this? It's so obvious and it's such a nice method. Um, and it's, although technically quite challenging to do, um, it, it's, it's you know, very straightforward in another way. And the idea is this. When an RNA is being translated, by definition, it's got ribosomes on it. Okay? So the ribosomes are moving along the message, turning that message into protein. So by definition, you'll have a series of ribosomes moving along the message. And you can isolate message from the cell. This is um, an example. So this is a stretch of mRNA. And... You can see um, on this mRNA there's lots of ribosomes bound, and you can actually see the, um, the new polypeptide chain being extruded from these ribosomes. And these structures are called polysomes. So most RNAs in the cell um, have multiple ribosomes attached at any one time. Um, the cell is getting the maximum amount of protein it can out of these things. So here's the idea, which is, you know, blindingly obvious when you think about it. If you isolate the polysome from the cell and you digest away everything that's not got ribosomes attached to it or covering it, what's left is the message that's got ribosomes covering it or, or protecting it. Um, and this will be the sum total of all the messenger RNA that's being translated. That will be protected by ribosomes. Whereas any messenger RNA that's not being translated will just get degraded. So all you've got to do, and as I say, it's technically a little challenging, but in principle all you've got to do is to isolate your polysomes digest away all the RNA that's not covered with ribosomes, at the same time isolate your total message and make cDNA uh, and fragment it, as we've talked about before. Put these now through exactly the same process, so turn them into cDNA, do luminous sequencing, and then compare your total mRNA, your RNA-seq data, with the data that represents just those parts of the message which are protected by the ribosomes. And that will tell you which bits of message are actually being actively translated. Um, and this is called ribosome profiling, and it was invented by this guy here, Jonathan Weissman, um, who's a real genius. And I, I've, I know him pretty well, and I, he works at um, UCSF in San Francisco in the States. And almost every talk of his I've sat in, I've gone, that's such a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? And he's had loads of great ideas in his career, and he's a really um, fantastic guy. Shoe in for a Nobel Prize one day, I reckon, because he's just so smart. Um, so does this work? 
Yes, it does. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you. So here's some, um, some data from his very first paper, which was published, I think, in, in Cell. I know, in Science. Beg your pardon. So what you're looking at here is uh, the green trace represents RNA-seq data. So you've got a, um, a gene here starting um, 30 or so bases before the start point of the gene. Zero is the ATG, so it's the first codon in the gene, and then it goes on to downstream of the gene, so these are um, sequences downstream and then runs out here somewhere. Um, so the green trace is the RNA-seq data, and what it shows is that there's pretty good representation of that message right the way through. And then the blue bars represent uh, the regions which are protected by the ribosomes. And the first thing that you can see is there's a lot of ribosomes parked on the message upstream from the start site of the gene. So the gene actually starts here, What's happening is that the ribosomes are binding upstream of that region and essentially waiting their turn to move down the message and turn that message into protein. Uh, we knew that already. We know that ribosome binding sites are found upstream of genes. And what you can see is they don't go much more than about 14 bases before the ATG codon. So there's no protection by ribosomes up here at all. Then the ribosomes protect all the way through, but then um, there's a chunk of RNA at the three prime end of the gene that's made, but again, not protected by ribosomes. So the ribosomes are dropping off before they reach the end of the message. What's really remarkable about this data, I think, is you can see very clearly there's a three base periodicity to that data. And that's because the ribosomes are moving along three bases at a time as they move along the codons. So this um, method is sufficiently detailed that it can actually see ribosomes moving down the message in, in three base jumps. Uh, so it's very spectacular. Now, by comparing the um, number of reads which are protected by a ribosome with just the number of reads which you get from the message, you can work out for each gene the efficiency of translation. So given a certain level of message, how much of that message is likely to be turned into protein? And the really staggering result from this is there's about a hundredfold variation in gene, from gene to gene. So you might have two genes which are expressed at the same amount in terms of the messenger RNA that's produced, but one of them is producing 100 times more protein than the other. And this is why um, the correlation between RNA-seq data, the transcriptome data, and the proteome is relatively poor, because the RNA-seq and the microarray methods don't pick up this variation. They just tell you how much message there is. Whereas ribosome profiling does pick up the information, and if you look at the correlation between ribosome profiling data and proteome data, it's pretty good. So you can actually get a good estimate of how much protein is being produced by looking at how many ribosomes are bound to a given piece of message. And all of that can be done um, using uh, high-throughput sequencing. Um, another thing that Jonathan found was that there's no protection of large non-coding RNAs. So these big RNAs don't have ribosomes bound. So they might be doing something, but they're certainly not producing any protein. And um, another thing that you can see is that if you change conditions, the efficiency with which different messages are translated can alter. So that is simply saying there's post-transcriptional gene regulation. You may have message being made at the same level, but you may change between two conditions, and a particular message suddenly gets much more efficiently translated. So the cell is regulating how much patient produces from pre-existing message. And um, there's been lots of studies done on this and lots of um, other things. This early work was done in yeast, uh, but it's been looked at in bacteria and human cells, um, and uh, the same sort of results are seen. Right, I think this is a good time to wrap up. So to finish, what are the key points? DNA sequencing is becoming extremely cheap, fairly cheap, uh, and very quick. So we've gone from um, whole genome sequencing that cost you know, literally billions of dollars to standard human genome sequence now will cost less than $1,000. Um, so that's a million-fold drop in price over the space of a couple of decades. Um, the original human genome sequence took 15 or so years to produce. You can now knock out a decent human genome in a week. Uh, you can knock out a bacterial genome on the nano, uh, nanopore in an hour or two. And again, the first bacterial genomes took years. So as a consequence of this, there's huge amounts of data pouring out of lots of different labs around the world, including many of the labs here in Birmingham. And there are a lot of consequences for this, for medicine, for diagnostics, for studying epidemiology, 
um, for looking at you know, ways of controlling infections, for designing new therapeutics, for forensics, um, for looking at human populations, uh, where do we all come from, looking at, um, you can even get genomes from um, fossilised remains, so from mammoths and uh, you know, people have reassembled the Neanderthal genome and so on, uh, and so on and so on. So lots of really interesting biology comes out of this. Uh, what I've covered very briefly in um, the second part of this lecture, but you'll hear a lot more about in the rest of this module, um, is you can also look at messenger RNA um, and at translation in messenger RNA using um, high-throughput methods. It's more expensive. The RNA-seq in particular is pricey because to get good resolution, you need greater depth of sequencing. So you can't multiplex in the same way as you do with genome sequencing. Um, but ribosomal profiling is really valuable because it links the transcriptomics and the proteomics. And it enables us to see what is it that causes a particular mRNA to be translated or not translated into a protein. So those four lectures were really by way of an introduction. You'll hear a lot more technical detail now um, from the other people teaching on this module. Um, hopefully by the end of it you'll have a really good idea about how you would go about generating and analysing this sort of data, um, which is pretty much essential um, if you want to do anything in, in biotech these days. Okay, I'll stop at that point. Thanks for your attention. Um, if you could let me have the register back. And if anyone wants to uh, be nominated or nominate somebody else for the committee, please take the forms along to the teaching office. Uh, if you don't, you'll get nagged, so you might as well do it now. <laughs>